I know you have your Bibles with you, so let's go quickly to 2 Peter chapter 1. I read from verse number 2. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this reason, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith Goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ but whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind Forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome in the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for your word. I pray, my God, that you will speak through me. Bless your people today that none of us shall leave this place the same way as we came in. Last week, we started building this house. It's a seven-story building of our life. Spiritual story building. And the first that we looked at was the faith. He says, add to your faith. So therefore, the faith is the foundation of that building. Our faith in Christ Jesus. There are a lot of faiths around there. People worship other religions and call them faiths. But this faith that we are talking about is our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord and our obedience to him. That is our faith. That is the foundation. Now, as we walk about in this life, and you meet people on the street, you don't know what kind of faith because it, it doesn't show. Somebody can be a Muslim that you don't know. Somebody can be a Buddhist that you will not know, except maybe they are dressed up in their costume or whatever. When you're a Christian and walking up, nobody will know. So what it is, foundations are not seen. Foundations are not necessarily seen. In the building, this building's foundation, you will never see it. You came in there, it has been built on already. So usually foundations are not seen, but foundations are very important. Because the foundation actually holds the whole building. Some people are building skyscrapers upon their lives and they don't have even the right foundation. You see, when we walk about there, we don't just go, I'm a Christian, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Muslim. No. You know, that faith is in there. It must be there. And that is important that you have it. You must be a Christian, period. Some people say we are believers. Believers in what? Believe, you can believe in anything. I don't like the word believers that much because everybody says they believe. And some people don't like the Christian, but I would say the Christ-like person. I'm a Christ-like person. I'm like Christ. If I'm like Christ, I complete everything. Hallelujah. And so therefore, just as people are having semantics and having all kinds of things, I'm not into that. I mean, I'm a, I can say I'm a believer. I'm a, I believe in Christ Jesus. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. But let's say that this, our faith 
must be intact. Hallelujah. The foundation must be pure, must be solid, must be so, so, it must be there. So your belief in the Lord, and we've done that already, our salvation must be intact. And you have to also believe in that salvation and be assured of that salvation. Because if you're not assured of the salvation, you'll be shaking. Hallelujah. I am a child of God. I am a Christian. I'm a Christ-like person. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's my Savior and Lord. Hallelujah. Nobody can take it away from me. You cannot argue me out of it. I am solid. I am there. Nobody can shake me with Buddhism. You can't shake me with Muslim and Islam. You can't shake me with Sikhism or whatever it is. I am a child of God and I'm a Christ-like believer of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That is my foundation. And so, foundations are very solid, very important. And he's saying it, and it's very, very true because, like I said, they are not necessarily seen. You don't go brag about it necessarily, but solid. And so, if your foundation is solid, then this is how Peter, by the Spirit of God, is asking us to build our lives on. So we need to get it first. Hallelujah. And so as you build on that faith, start with character. Christ-like character. The fruits of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, meekness, all kinds of that on it. When people see you, when you open your mouth to speak, your attitude, does it show that you are a Christ-like person? Very important. Some people are going for gifts instead of character. People are pursuing. That's why I see some people want to pray to have power, but they don't want to obey God to live the character. They want to pray for power, but they don't want to be obedient and live the character. And it's important that your faith as you walk with God, please, that you understand that you go for character first. Go for the love, the joy, the peace, the meekness, the long-suffering, the, 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 all that in the fruits of the Spirit. Bear them. That shows that you are a Christ-like person. Your faith is solid. So we looked at that. There are many scriptures we can go in there, not for today, but it's important that you understand that as you build this character, the first floor, so the ground floor, the, the foundation is there, but the first floor actually is the character. Let's move on to the second floor. That's what I, we didn't get to last time. It says, add to this goodness, what? Knowledge. This knowledge in the Bible here is not just the possession or the acquisition of information. But it is the experiential of the information you acquire. In Greek or Hebrew, it's called yada. Yada. In fact, in my dialect, there's something called yada. And I'll tell you, yada. Yada means um, you've slept, okay. But uh, <laughs> when it goes deeper, <laughs> when it goes deeper, in my, let me put it, when they say menewada, it means I have an intercourse with you. That's what it is in my life. So I don't know whether they got it from there. So, yankoda means let's go to sleep. But then, when you go deeper and they say yakoda with somebody, it means you've had an intercourse with them. Do you know that the word yada in the original Hebrew, when the Bible says, and Adam knew Eve, and out of that, he, she conceived and bore Cain. That word, an adult knew Eve, is that they had an intercourse. So that word know, the root cause of knowledge, is not, it's marrying to something. So if you know somebody, it is, it's like you married to the person, you have an intercourse with the person. So the knowledge is not, what in the Bible here, knowledge is not an ordinary knowledge. Nobody knows Pastor Betty. More than I do. You said, you know, Prime Minister May. That knowledge is there. 
let's move on from the English. The English is weak. The English meaning of the word no is very weak. Oh, I know him very well. Oh, you know, you know a little bit about him. He's tall, handsome like me. <laughs> I know where he lives, fine. But when you go deeper into the word knowledge, it's really having an intimate relationship with the person or the thing. So the information that you acquire, must be, you must be intimate to that information. Not until you know. So it's not the book knowledge that we know. We've not arrived there. Even with the books that we go to study, if you have not even experienced that information and worked with it, you don't know it that much. Like I told you, somebody can go and learn chemistry and kill everybody in the hospital after that and got the first degree. You understand what I'm saying now? You must be able to um, experience it in a way. Hallelujah. You can be a doctor, but when you go to the theater, you'll be chopping people like something. You understand what I'm saying now? Instead of going, applying it to, yes, you know that you need a surgical knife. Yeah, you know the, all the chemical terms, all the, you know, and all, you know the chemicals that you have to inject and all that. And then you know all that, but when you're injecting, you go, boom, and you add more to that. You kill the person, isn't it? So you know something, but how even you do it is very important. That's where the wisdom comes in this time. But that's the knowledge you have to marry. So here, the word yada, which in my language also is very interesting, is to have an intimacy, it's an intimate word, no. So when you say, I know who I am, I know, yes, As you say that I know the Lord. You know what I'm saying? That means it is not just knowing about him, reading about him, but have an intimacy with God. And everything about him. I know this word. You must be intimate to that word. So it appears about 900 times in the Bible, very in the Hebrew word, and it's very important. It means, it, 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 when you say knowledge, including perceiving, learning, understanding, willing, performing, and experiencing. The word not knowledge includes these words. Perceiving, learning, understanding, willing to obey what you're learning, performing it, and experiencing it. It's not in, in, in intelligence. It's not something that you've acquired in your mind. It is actually exercising or actualizing it. Daniel chapter 11 verse 32b. He says, the people that know their God shall be strong and they shall do exploits. It means not just, just knowing about God. Daniel eleven thirty two 32b. It's not just knowing about God, but having an intimacy with God, experiencing him, exercising him. His words are exercised and obeyed. You are marrying to the person. You see, when, when you are intimate with something, you are actually very close and married. You are, you, are, you are intact. So what he hears is what you hear. What he says is what you say. What he thinks is what you think. You think the same, like twins. They open your mouth at the same time. Have you heard that? Identical twins. When you ask them a question, and they will say the same thing. Sometimes it's very, 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 it can be very annoying and very interesting as well. <laughs> Intimacy, talking about, this is that knowledge that he's talking about here. Not just acquisition of information. He's talking about knowledge of God, that we are intimate with God, solidly. Intimate with his word, solidly. You're obedient to his word, that's knowledge that we're talking about. So it's not an intelligence, it's not just acquiring information and all that. Spiritual understanding. It is, it is learning the, the, the information through practice. Practicing it. Internalize the knowledge. Paul said this in first, uh, Ephesians 1.17. He says that I pray, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation that makes God known to you. Amen. And so, you know, this knowledge that we talk about, sometimes we think we know God. It's a quest. It's, it's, it's a process. It is, that's why we come to church every day. That is why you have to study the word of God every day. That is why you have to go to prayer meetings every day. Because every day that you go and spend time with him, you are getting to know him better. 
And when you know him better here, when you add that to the faith, he says you will not be ineffective and you will not be unproductive. So sometimes the challenges that we have in life is not just because we don't pray that much. It's because also we don't know God that much to show us, to find out what he wants us to do at certain times in our lives. Is that correct? Because if you have an intimacy with him and know him and, 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 and you, you know his word, and you, you, you will not falter. That's why you don't stumble. I'm not saying you can make mistakes, but you see, when you know him, you'll be directed right. Even when you make mistakes, you come back. Are you with me? Knowledge. Add to that faith. The first one was goodness. The first floor. Second floor now we are building is what? Knowledge. Let's go to the third floor. Discipline. Self-control. Self-control. Self-control is something that every one of us are pursuing that right now. And I can see that every one of us wants to have it. If you don't have self-control, everything that you, the, the, the house will just be, be, be broken down. Self-control. Controlling self. And Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, do you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 24 to 27. He says, do you know that in the race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And so the foundation, first of all, is goodness. Have the, God, have the God kind of character. Secondly, knowledge, knowing God. Have a quest for knowing God. Have a quest for knowing God. Have a quest for marrying God completely. An intimacy with God continues. It comes with prayer. It comes with studying the word. It comes with all that. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about and the third one is have discipline. Because if you don't have discipline, you cannot actually, uh, your quest for knowing God uh, will be weak. You have to discipline yourself in, the, in your following after God. Very important. Because there are a lot of things that will keep you away from following him. There will be a lot of things that will keep you away from knowing him. There will be a lot of things that will keep you away from having that character. Because for some of us, our problem is our mouth. No, don't be quiet on me today. I know, I know some weeks back when I was talking about hope, you were all excited. After this, I want to have text messages saying, you know, Pastor, I was a good preacher. <laughs> Our mouth. Oh, we will talk and backbite. Like I said, Doc, there are certain things that you see that oh, this one, hey, no, no. But there are certain things people do so easily. Backbiting, criticizing. Condemning, talking about people. We find it so easy, and it's a, it's a sin that we do without realizing that we are sinning. And the devil knows that. And because we, as I'm speaking to you as a church, because we are family, we meet every day, we know, you know what, some of us, I see every week. I don't even see some of my family members every week. We are, for so many years that I've been a pastor of this church, I see you every week. You are my brothers, you are my sisters. You, do I care? I care. <laughs> you understand? And because we meet like that, we know each other so much. We become friends so much that sometimes we are not careful. We will take it for granted and we begin to spoil each other by saying all kinds of things. That is why we need to discipline ourselves so that there will be love and peace and we keep our mouths shut. Just your mouth. Discipline the mouth. There are areas, discipline the way we think. That's the first one I should have said. You're thinking. In Christ Jesus, the way you think, negative thoughts that may come your way, that will discourage you in this life, you don't need them. Discipline your thoughts. Somebody said something before, I think, Pastor, you know, preaching that, I remember. He says, your mind 
hasn't got, doesn't need a passport or visa to travel. As we sit down here in this room, your mind can be in Nigeria straight away. It doesn't need visa. But some of us, some, some people may need visa to go to Nigeria. You understand what I'm saying now? Your mind can be somewhere, you don't need, your mind runs, and then, you know, as you sit down here, I'm speaking to you right now, there are thoughts running through your mind. So if you don't discipline your mind, you'll not be even thinking of what I'm telling you right now. You know how the enemy can steal away from us? And whilst I'm speaking right now, you're thinking of something that's, hmm, Pastor Sam, what else? The mind. Discipline. Be speaking in church, people be on the social media, in the church, checking off people who are following you. I didn't know that this following brings money. So they throw things out there. And then people will follow you. They pay you. Ah, I said, look, it's all of us. I mean, we should be going back. This is a very good business in doing the right way. You know what I'm saying now? You be in the church there, your mind is somewhere thinking about somebody next door and all that. Somebody who is not here. Your mind, discipline your mind. It's one of those areas that enemy can get us. <laughs> Discipline in your behavior. Some people, you know what, like I said, please, so, you know, I, I can't be talking about this and talk about some of these things. I'm a very practical preacher. When I say some of these things, don't take it very personal. Our behavior, sometimes my behavior is not up to standard. So also you, your behavior also is not up to standard. And you see, these behaviors, if we don't, if we don't discipline these behaviors very well, it will not help us to build, build the house strongly. So you see somebody who is very prayerful, behavior stinks. <laughs> somebody, somebody who's, who is very alive, you see them all the time, bump it. My God, when they open their mouth to speak, oh my God, discipline. When they open their mouth, they are nearly insulting you. You know, me, I have to even watch my mouth as well, as I even man the puppet. Be, because it can be very sharp, it can be something, but sometimes, you see, the word of God must be very strongly preached and all that. So I have to also discipline myself so I would not offend, even with my good intentions. It's true. Discipline. Husband and wife. For you, your prayers, you should fast 40 days that you will not let this hand fly, whether you are male or female, because it can, it's not only male that that the hand flies. Females also can make the hand flies. They are not, they don't fly it. What they do is that they try to push you away, but their hand may be stronger than you. When you open your mouth, what do you say to your wife or your husband? What do you hear? Your children. You say, anger is my weakness, overcome it. You missed a very good place to put your hands together for God. You have to discipline it, please. Because, because of anger, Moses missed out on something. God told him to speak to the stone. Whether it's for disobedience or he was very angry with the people, he actually struck the stone. Anger. Discipline. Discipline in serving God. Oh, today, a small challenge. I stopped. Seven. No, no, please, don't take it personal. Sometimes you have to. Other times you have to just discipline yourself. Discipline. You see, indiscipline can cost you a lot. You can be praying about something that will come your way. Your indiscipline can actually deny you of so many things. Go to an interview and just not discipline yourself. Just go and throw your weight about. There's something that was, is for you. You, you will not get it. And then you think it's a devil. You're a member of Dominion Center. And then we pray, pray, pray for jobs. Pray, pray, pray for jobs. Pray, pray, pray for jobs. Fasted. And then your indiscipline can cost you that job. And then you think that church is not powerful. Pray for me to get a job. May the Lord help you. Because your indisciplines are the cost of most of our problems. Shall I say it or not? Shall I say it or not? Do you think God is so wicked that when we pray, he won't answer? Do you think God will always be, be let us to have patience all the time about our things? In fact, the patient might get to a place that he will know that we are so tired that he should do it for us. But I tell you something, we should also realize that we also have responsibilities. 
It won't be your pastor. It won't be your bishop. It won't be the prophet. It won't be your wife. It won't be your husband. It won't be everybody but you. Yourself. Ask yourself that what is me that I need to change so that I'll get on with everybody. Because you ask yourself, maybe there's something that I do wrong. Sometimes, check it. Sometimes, you see, what you think is your strength can be your weakness. Maybe the way you do things might not be the way, but that is what you think. You think. A mindset. So your mindset makes you to behave somehow. Your mindset makes you to think somehow. Your mindset makes you do something. And you are hurting people. Don't realize in it. I'll continue. I'm telling you. So sometimes what you think is your strength can be your weakness. Discipline. That's the third floor. Let's go to the fourth floor. Perseverance. 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 Perseverance is persistence in sticking to a plan. So you, 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 you have added to your faith this character. Good character. Is that why some people have very good character and realize what's happening to them? You know what I'm saying? So having good character alone is not enough. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can be loving and have peace and joy and all. You know what I'm saying? But uh, you have to k- keep on acquiring knowledge. And then discipline. Then perseverance. Sticking to the plan of God concerning your life. So if you are always giving up easily. You are somebody who is giving up easily. Let me ask, tell you something. You will never be able to have whatever you want straight away. It doesn't happen that way. So whatever you want, it must happen to you. So if it doesn't happen to you, hey. You understand what I'm saying? And sometimes too, because we also want to think that it's the enemy that restricts our plans, our work with God. We always resolve to attend to have a way of dealing with it. And sometimes, instead of, let's say something, uh, uh, first of all, your plan must be God's plan. Number one, not your own plan. You have to submit your plan to God. Okay? If God even gives you a plan, if even God is working with you, if God gives you an idea, if God gives you a vision, if God gives you a purpose and you are perceiving that purpose, something can come to challenge you. Remember that. Whilst we are on this world, uh, you are not going to have everything straight away like that in your life. Nobody. Jesus never had it. Paul never had it. Peter never had it. Why do you think you have it? Listen to me. God had a plan for Jesus. When he walked on earth, do you think when he just surfaced and started Saying the people will be following him. Oh my God. His own people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the leaders that you thought are very learned will understand. Know all the history. They were the ones who were hindering him. And so therefore, Jesus did it to him. So therefore, you must have an edge. I call it shock, spiritual shock absorber. When you go, boom, you still stand. Hallelujah. You face it. That will keep you going all the time. You are in this world, but you are not of this world. The things of this world, the challenges of this world will hinder your progress. Fact. You know, there's, there's something that you cannot deny. Fact. And so therefore, you must have a very tough skin and patience in this life. You are one that gives up easily then the foundation is not strong. Go home and read James chapter 5. I will not read it 10 to 11. Abraham, an example. The widow, Luke 18, 1 to 18. Where is your strength in your work? It's very important. So, Christ is there. He said, we'll be with you till the close of the age. But don't leave him. Stay with him. What we do is that we leave him. We go away from him whilst he's there for us. But we leave him. Are you listening to me carefully here? Is we quit before the time. Solid rock. I stand. There was a story that I 
uh, uh, let me just, um, uh, the accurate, I must be very accurate with this story. It's, it's, it's a historical story. These uh, armies, I think they were Spanish, and they were going to fight. So they took their ships and crossed the sea to the other side, where the enemy, the enemy, the enemy zone, the enemy zone. And when they got there, this captain, this leader of this general, you know, with all the, uh, the, the, the ships full of uh, uh, soldiers, got there, and then they all came out of the boat, ready to fight, and then what he did next was he set fire on to all the ships. They've traveled maybe a thousand miles across the river. They set fire to all the ships. All the ships should burn. There's no going back. We are fighting till we win. You think this, looking at him, naturally, eh? if we want to be very natural, this leader is wicked. Why should you bring us this far, cross the sea just to fight, and the, our mode of transportation, our means of transportation back to our fathers and our parents and our children? Didn't he care? You set that this ablaze, maybe 10 ships condemned. And he called them, hey! No turning back. I have decided. Come on, sing it. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. This walk, there's no turning back. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. And look, when they stayed on, they fought and they won. They conquered and they won. And they just rest, take, took the land. That is what Christ has made us. In fact, for us, he has already provided and promised us the victory. Amen. You see, for us, not even promise, we already have it. And so whatever you're going through in this life here, don't give up. Don't give up on your faith. Listen, there are certain things that you have to give up. I mean, when I say give up, please understand me. There are certain things that you have to walk away from. But you see, giving up on your faith, I'm talking about. Yeah. Giving up your, your work, I'm talking about. Giving up on something that God has orchestrated for you is what I'm talking about here. So if, if something is not good for you at a point, uh, you can walk away from it. Uh, you understand what I'm saying now? And that's also part of it. Okay, so perseverance, but don't give up on God. Amen. That's what he's saying. Amen, it's perseverance. Okay, fight till the end. Amen. Hallelujah. And God is, that's, that is what? So it's a joyful acceptance under tough situations. Some people haven't got it yet. Yes, you cry a little bit, but you don't give up. Hallelujah. Don't ever give up. The pain you're going through. Don't give up on Christ. There are some people, they will sabotage your life. They want to hinder your life. Don't give up on God. They will say all manner of things against your faith and your work. Don't give up on God. If you are believing God for something don't, and it's not come yet, don't give up on him. Hallelujah. Your life in Christ Jesus, your eternal life, where you are spending eternity, is much more important than anything here on this earth. Sometimes I'm very, you know, when people say, oh, I have one life here on earth and all that, let me live it. I, it's very good to say that, but how, how are you living it? Sorry, you understand what I'm saying now? Sorry. <laughs> how are you living it? Uh, this life, you, I'm living it. How are you living it? Fifth floor. It's called godliness. 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 That is, it's called reverent wonder or a reverence. Reverence. Do you have a fear for God or fear of God? How much do you honor God? It's honor. And so, therefore, your, your faith added to your faith, um, godly character, added to your faith, um, knowledge, 
add, you've added to your faith. Um, what's the, the other one? Speak to me, please. Discipline. Discipline. Now, uh, and then you've come to perseverance, isn't it? Now, here you are what? On what? Godliness. Godliness. Reverence. Hey! Hey! Honoring God. You find people even in the house of God insulting people during the worship. I'm sorry. Usher tells you to sit somewhere and you chew the, the, the tongue or the teeth. <laughs> Reverence. No, I, hey, listen, I'm a practical preacher. Let me get on there. Because there are certain things that you, know, you will not be doing some all kinds of things. But there are certain things that we do that we don't realize. That's what I'm humming at now. Nobody has told me anything. I've been a pastor. I've pastored you for over 30, nearly about that much. So I, I know and I, 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 I sense and I, I see. And I, I, you understand? Me, I watch things around. I will just turn around sometimes. But my eyes are made to see. Yeah. So, something so in as much as I, I, will, I will have to correct it. Coming to church, you are fighting. Just after church, out there fighting. Fighting with anything, everything about the church. Fighting with the pastor, you know, criticizing the pastor. Honor God. In fact, the Bible says this. It says, honor God with all your substance and with the first fruit of your increase. The, the honor, honor is very important here we need to look at. In fact, it's something that, uh, honor God, honor God. So whatever you are doing for God is honoring him. Your service to God is honoring him. Your giving to God is honoring him. Everything that you are doing for the kingdom is honor to God. So therefore, keep honoring God and it's good in, in, the, in your building, in, in, your, in, in your life, building your life, honor, honor, honor. You don't come to church for anyhow. Your service to God, so whatever you are doing, keep doing it. Don't let anybody talk you away from it. Don't let anybody to keep you away from honoring God. Keep honoring him. You don't see him. We don't see him, but the service to his kingdom is honor, honor. You're not doing for Pastor Sam. You're not doing for uh, Pastor Betty or any of the pastors. You're not doing for anybody. Don't even say you're doing for church. You're doing for God. See that way. Oh, Pastor Sam did. I didn't find it. He didn't realize it. No, if I don't see it, God has seen it. He will bless you. Amen. And so first of all, the first honor is your work that you do, your service, your heart towards God. When you come to church, your worship is an honor to God. Amen. Your dance is an honor to God. Your obedience is an honor to God. Your respect for what is happening is an honor to God. Some people, uh, they, they come to church, they don't tell them what to do. Pastor tells, get up, you will sit down. And not, sit down. Sometimes I sit down when I'm tired. That's okay. God knows your heart. But then, you know, some people just walk about. and walk, You don't respect anybody. Some people might be older than me. You don't respect. God has given me the oversight here. And listen, uh, when I come in here, I do my bit. If you, I'm, and this, this is not to draw attention to myself. I'm teaching you the truth. If you have the guts to even criticize your pastor, you don't have hope. Then you don't know the word. Your pastor may be wrong. Pray for him. And this is not an excuse. Now, you say, when you say some of these things, like, oh, pastor is speaking for himself. He doesn't want anybody to challenge him. Oh, please. Challenge what? <laughs> what do I have posed for you to challenge? <laughs> so people say, so don't make up your mind that you will stop this man. Or stop this woman, or stop this lady. Or, you, know, you, know, you don't do that, but I'm just saying that. Look, let me put it that way. Um, I've, I've talked around it. Honoring God by what you do. The Bible, the another level, it says, Honor your father and your mother so your days shall be longer. So the elders of this church must receive honor. Every one of us. Because they are older than you, they are fathers and mothers to you. Give them honor, respect. Oh, put your hands together and give them praise. praise. <laughs> and so there are a few honors that are in the Bible. And then it says, honor those who lead and also teach you the truth with double honor. So I must say that because I'm teaching on honor. I won't wait for somebody to come and tell you. I'm telling you myself, I know it. The fact that I've not talked about it, I don't, I don't, I, I know it. When I'm honored, I know. When I'm not honored, I know. Amen. Amen. The fact that I'm talking, I don't talk about it. I don't wait for somebody to come Father's Day for you to honor your pastor. I don't say come and lick my feet. But 
by virtue of where I stand for you. I'm talking to this chair. Listen to it. By virtue of the fact that you come here every day to submit your spiritual life to my leadership. You may not hear this anywhere. Hear it from me alone. Please, whatever you do to me, to my wife, to the leaders of this church who also support this, even to every one of us, do it with honor and respect. It says, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Okay, and, and so um, I, um, I just want to quickly just, um, um, I wanted to read something to you, but uh, I think it's possible. But let me go to the sixth floor, sixth and seventh floor, and I'll finish off quickly. The sixth and the seventh floor are almost like the same. The sixth floor is called brotherly love. The filial love. Most of our love to each other is at the filial level. So sometimes when somebody says to you, Pastor Sam, I love you very much. When they really use the word very much. I wonder that kind of level you are talking about. Amen. Lot of our love that we think we love people is just filial love. Let me tell you, brotherly love. You want to just be brotherly, very nice, friendly. Hello, hi, how are you? There's no animosity amongst us. You know what I'm saying now? And all that. Oh, praise God, hallelujah. Amen, you know what I'm saying now? Oh, fine. You will do certain things for them here and there. That's brotherly love and all that kind. Please, let me say something. Brotherly love is very important that we love each other. And it's there. But let me tell you what happened. When P Jesus met Peter, let's go to John. Please. And then I will connect that with the seventh floor and then we'll finish. Okay? Okay. Peter, here in John 21, 15 to 16, 17, when Jesus resurrected, incident, when he came back and met Peter, look at, look at this. He says, When they have finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. That first love that Jesus asked Peter was agape love. Agape love. Is, I, let me describe it before I go further. It's the God kind of love. It's the love that is not based on merit of the person, but rather unconditional and based on them as an image bearer of Christ. This love is kind and generous. It continues to give even the other uh, you continue to give the other even if they are unkind to you or unresponsive to you or unworthy. It, desire, it only desires good things for the other and it's compassionate. G that's the agape love, the unconditional love. You, the, the love for the person even if the person does not deserve it. The love for the person even if the person is unkind to you. The love for the person if the person has insulted you. It's called agape love. But when Jesus asked Peter, he says, do you agape me? Peter responded with filial love. Lord, you know that I love you. The response from Peter was a filial love. And then Peter, Jesus went on again. Because if he had first four, if he had answered with agape love, Jesus would not have asked again. And he says, and he says Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? The word love here is agape again. He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You see, this word love in there, they are not all the, always the same in the Bible. That's why some people say, I love you, I just love. I just look at myself. <laughs> if you love me, you show me by example, by practical things. But, 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 but. And I will tell you. It's not just words. Words are cheap. You love because, because you fancy them. They are probably something that they, you like. It's a liking. It's a love. Now, he says, yes. Then he responds again. He says, take care of my sheep. The third time, he said to him. Now, here, Peter was becoming, <laughs> said, why, why are you asking me this? You know what? I mean, there's something here. See? So he says, 
Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. <laughs> Where was he hurt? Yeah. You know, have you? Yeah. Go ahead. When you, when you really, you know, he was hurt. Why were you hurt? The man is asking you. He's answered you twice. You've answered twice. You've answered me. Ah, why is this man hurting me? Because, you see, the answer that he was giving Jesus was not what Jesus was expecting. And he says, he said, Lord, you know all things. Ah, you know all things. The person who's asking you that you love me actually knows that it's what you're saying is a filial love. It's not a girlfriend love. He said, you know, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, when Peter then realized, so Peter was on the fourth floor, the, the sixth floor. He was on the brother in love, Peter. So the third one, when he responded, do you love me? Then Peter now climbed to the seventh floor. Divine love. No brotherly love. Divine love. Generous love. Unconditional love. That's the top floor. That is where God wants us to be. On top of the building. Where the love that you have for God, have for one another, is rich and divine, not just words. Listen, there's something that happened in the Bible. Now we'll quote it and then we'll go quickly. Time is fast, man. I'm so sorry because I wanted to finish it. There was something that happened between David and I'm using this place. I, I was looking for some scriptures that will not relate to a leadership thing, but I didn't find anything. Let me read this. You know this story was quoted last week. When Jesus, when, 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 when David was with his people and he was thirsty, there was sacrifice here I'm going to talk about here. Here, he says here, at that time, David was in the stronghold and the Philistines, the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. David longed for water and said, oh, that someone will get me drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. He longed for something. His heart was for something. The leader longed for water and asked them. That time there was no water. The enemies were there. It was a ter territory that was, you couldn't do anything. He looked at me, he's asking me for there's no water. It's, we don't have it. You know what they did? So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, carried it back to David, but he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before God. Far be it from me to do this, he said. This is not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives, people who sacrificed their lives. David realized that the sacrifice of the people was, should not be meant for him, but should be meant for God. And so, whenever even your leader is, is in, even asked for the sacrifice of it, it's not for him. It's for the people. Because it'd be bad for you to be receiving sacrifice from men and not give it to God. Whatever you are doing, any sacrifice you give to somebody, you are giving it to God. Amen. And God wants you to, to get to the level of that floor, the seventh floor, that when you are there, you know when? I went to Dubai recently. And they said there's a, is it Kali, Kali whatever, Kali, uh, it's a poor building. Kali, Kali, yes. When I went there to check on that building, Dr. Barrow, I was not looking at the first floor. I was not looking, I couldn't even find the foundation. I was looking to see the top, the topmost, to snap a picture. So you can see your pastor lying down on the floor because we were very close. You understand? To take a picture. Everybody wants to be at the top floor. That is what people see. When they say something is magnificent, something is on, they look at the top floor. The divine love, that is where you have to be. Now, when you are, yeah, 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 listen to me. When, when you are on the top floor, people see that others become irrelevant because the top takes care of everything. May God bless you and keep you. May God bless you and keep you. May God bless you and keep you. When you are walking in divine love, everything follows. Everything follows. People will be judging you by your divine love. Know how much you pray. Know how much you persevere. Your divine love. God bless you.